morning. Suppose you had to visualize an invisible problem. Suppose you wanted to tell the world about climate change with an image that was so clear, everybody understood what was going on. This has long been the solution of the mass media. Sad, lonely polar bears and things melting, ice sheets and glaciers. And these are actually all stock photos that appear in media reports about global warming. And they're all very threatening. And if you add them all up, you get something like this. What do these images of climate change tell us? This was one of the first questions I asked when I started writing about climate change as a journalist. The central thing about these images and many stories in the media is that they show us climate change as the apocalypse. They show us a world in which we don't belong because we can't live in these conditions. And you know, the story of Apocalypse is really the oldest story in the book. I'm sure you've heard some version of the story when you were young. I remember hearing it while listening to Michael Jackson's Earth song. I was eight and I had a ghetto blaster and I played that record over and over again. And it was very dramatic. He sings about the crying earth and the weeping shores and he repeats a few times over, look what we've done to the world. And I was impressed. I wasn't too impressed. <laughs> this is me with my sister on a holiday. I was a happy kid. But the point is, my point is, you can't grow up without hearing about the end of the world one way or the other. In fact, it's everywhere around you. You can go see the destruction of the world in any theater near you at any time. Whether it's X-Men or Independence Day, or the day after tomorrow, or some other movie or show. Now, of course, when it comes to climate change, politicians and activists will tell you that we have a little bit of time left to act. We must act swiftly and decisively. And if we don't, well, then we'll run ourselves off a cliff. And so this is how many people respond to the story of climate change. Because the thing about the apocalypse is that you can't stop it. This story, the story I just showed you, is so scary, it's paralyzing. And psychology tells us that when people are scared, they find a way to ignore the issue. It also tells us that scared people are less creative and less prone to action. So, we imagine our own destruction all the time, but it's not getting us anywhere. And the truth is, there is no cliff. Millions of people are already suffering the consequences of climate change, and their suffering won't just magically disappear at some point, along with the rest of life on Earth. So, not only is the story of climate change as the apocalypse counterproductive, but it's also wrong, and we need a better story. One that doesn't make us feel hopeless and powerless and doomed. And personally, I believe that the media, journalists like me, have a huge responsibility in getting the story right. Because the way we talk about this issue determines our engagement, it determines our future. So let's get the story right. I think it should be accurate, it should be human, and it should be hopeful. First, let's get accurate about the cause of global warming. This shows you the sources of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution until a few years back. Now, as you can see, the US and Europe account for little over half of all emissions. Now, the story behind this chart is painful. It's about colonialism, exploitation, tremendous injustice. While 
exploiting others for our gain, we started changing the climate forever. And today, China is the largest single emitter of greenhouse gases. But if you look at the carbon footprint of consumers, you'll see that the Americans and the Europeans are still way ahead of the Chinese. So in the real story of climate change, specific people are responsible, mostly the wealthiest consumers. The richest 10% of consumers emit almost half of all greenhouse gases. Think about that for a second. Not only have the rich accumulated most wealth and power, they're also wrecking the planet like nobody else. And so climate change is about us. Western countries got rich while causing climate change, and now rich consumers are causing more climate change. And it's not just the super rich, although they are the undisputed champions of global warming. Think about your own holidays. When I flew from Amsterdam to New York last fall, I put 20 times more carbon in the air than the average person in Mali in an entire year, with just one holiday. So climate change is about us, and it's about rich consumers causing more climate change. Now, the next question, of course, is who will suffer the consequences? Well, eventually everyone will suffer the consequences of global warming one way or the other. But the rich will be able to adapt. They'll buy their way out of trouble. And the poor, of course, have less options. And so this map should be alarming. It shows you the effects of climate change on food security. Climate change causes more drought in regions that are already dry, and so it'll be harder, especially in Africa, to grow crops and get access to food. And here is an even more revealing map. I read about it in an essay by Naomi Klein, the activist and author. The pink area drawn on this map shows you the border of the desert. It's a piece of land where less than 200 milliliters, millimeters of rain falls each year. It's habitable, you can grow a few crops, but life here is hard. And these regions have seen conflict throughout history. Now, it turns out that if you plot Western drone attacks on the same map, there's a remarkable pattern. A great deal of Western military intervention is concentrated in these dry areas. It's where people are fighting over oil and water, and it's where people radicalize and join terrorist groups. So the real story of climate change, it's not, um, it's not the end of the world. It's violence. It's what happens when a few people emit carbon, and then a lot of people will know the consequences. It's extreme, horrific, long-term, widespread violence, in the words of the writer Rebecca Solnith. It's the few hurting the many. And it's going on every day. Because we're still emitting carbon at a massive scale. And the way things are developing now, we're looking at three degrees of warming already. And the truth is, along with the temperatures, we're turning up the amount of suffering on Earth. We're turning up the volume of existing problems. And so, unfortunately, I'm not going to tell you that we can fix this, that we can somehow solve climate change as if it were a mathematical equation. But I can tell you this. Even on our warming planet, there are reasons for hope. Because millions of people have started to end the age of fossil fuels, to end the inequality of the current system, and to end the violence. And they've, started, they've stopped asking, what have we done to the world? And they've started to heal the world, which, of course, is another great Michael Jackson song. <laughs> Over the last few years, millions of people showed up on the streets, and they had a tremendous impact. When they showed up, and they pressured politicians to make the right decisions, 
And then, when they returned to their homes and pushed for change all around them, in their jobs, in their schools, in their cities, these people changed the story. They recognized that climate change is a form of violence caused by some and suffered by others. And so when they showed up in Paris at the climate conference last year, they demanded an end to the violence. They demanded climate justice. And the politicians listened. A treaty was signed in Paris that was a huge step in the right direction. It wasn't good enough, but it recognized the needs of the most vulnerable people on Earth. And it's these people that made it possible. They changed the story. They created the room for political leaders to start moving. And of course, it's not just the people that call themselves activists. It's not just the people that show up on the streets. In fact, many of us are part of this vast network of change makers. And even if you do a tiny thing for the climate, whatever it may be, however small it may be, you're part of this network of people that is pushing for change and that is making the world a better place. And we're getting help from the people working on clean technology. Just look at the cost of solar going down over time. And you know what the really cool thing about solar is? When you invest in it, you're also helping to end um, conflicts that started over oil and gas. So you're helping to create peace. This is peace energy, and it's getting cheaper by the day. Now, of course, it's hard to see change like this taking place, but we know from history that it can happen very quickly. This is the Easter parade in New York in 1900. Almost all vehicles are horse-drawn carts. This is the same parade only 13 years later. Almost all cars. So we know that change can happen very quickly, and just imagine what could happen to the rise of electric cars and batteries and other clean technologies you and I have never even heard of. Imagine how our cities might change. The fact is, this is not a sad story, it's a human story. It's full of contradictions. It hurts and it's wonderful. It has progress and setbacks, dread and joy. Climate change is not the end of the world. It's a wake-up call to attain peace and justice. And I know, I know this story is not easy, like sitting back and waiting for the apocalypse, but when we talk about climate change, this is the story worth telling. Thank you. Thank you.